I pray that, Lord, this will be a time that your spirit will stir your church like in the times of Zerubbabel. And that, Papa, we would all begin to enter into that place of being priests, standing in the gap on behalf of this nation, on behalf of our families, on behalf of our communities, of our villages, of um, this whole land, but, but the nations around. And we know that our prayers are powerful and effective to bringing down strongholds in Jesus' name. Amen. So... Um, on Wednesday, what we did was we had um, strategy table time. We love strategy table time. Amen? Amen. It's exciting. Um, and so, a strategy table time is really just taking before Papa the things that he's been speaking to us about now. And um, just laying them before him and saying, Papa, what are you saying about this? Because you know what happens is, a lot of times things remain abstract. Um, God, uh, God, God uses very um, expressive language a lot of times when he speaks to us and then we use expressive language but a lot of times we don't actually quite know what we're talking about. <laughs> and so coming to strategy table is great because we can put that down to, to uh, before Papa and say, uh, what does this mean? And, and then just be praying around, around that. And so the two things that we have brought before Papa is the whole area of crossover to inheritance and um, the, the venue of love. Now, where the venue of love came from, uh, um, I don't, don't know if you remember, I mentioned last week is, remember Papa's been speaking to us about blueprint, blueprint. I have a blueprint for you, and I'm going to reveal this blueprint to you. And, um, and so, you know, when you think blueprint, we all understand what blueprint means, but, but when it comes to the kingdom of God and, and, and what does that look like, we have no idea. Okay. So, blueprint is a great word, and, it, and, and, and it's a very descriptive word, but it's abstract. Amen? I don't know what that looks like when it comes to putting legs to, to anything. And so, Papa's been saying, I have a blueprint for you, I have a blueprint for you. And then he goes on and says, oh, your blueprint is too small. I mean, like, what on earth does that mean? Because we, first of all, didn't understand the blueprint in the first place. How are we going to understand it being bigger? So the confusion is probably just bigger. Um, and so it's kind of like, well, Papa, what are you talking about? And then when we, when, when we went over to uh, Winter Tea, um, somebody used the word blueprint. And I don't know what context it was in, but suddenly just this dish hit me. And um, I looked around and I looked at what was happening and I looked at people's lives and I looked at how they've been cared for. I, I looked at how people are being loved unconditionally. I looked at the extravagance. I looked at the lavishness of being of what's being poured out over people's lives. I looked at the waste. I looked at those that 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 might have completely ulterior motives, but they they were being fed, they were being loved on, they were being given, and I realized this is Papa's blueprint. It is a place that you lavish people with love no matter what the cost is and you don't weigh up that cost and Papa took us again as, as I've mentioned took us through the journey of our, our, um, our refugees and he said your only mandate is to love these people um, no other ulterior motives and, um, and, and we even realized that dishing out to them um, food uh, was was not restoring anybody's value. It was keeping them in the place of you are a refugee and I'm feeding you. And it was to bring them to a place that you are actually valued. We, we love you. You are family. And that we could honestly say but by the time they had left, we knew that they had become family. Yeah. And when we when we invited those refugees in, we didn't know what, what it was going to cost because it, we thought it was going to be a day or two. And if somebody had said, no, 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 it's going to be seven months <laughs> and there's going to be dentists, opt optometrists, there's going to be doctors, um, there's going to be three meals a day, um, there's going to be all kinds of, you know, blah, blah, blah that goes with life. Um, with 56, 58, 58 people for seven months, you would, 
And, and, and if somebody said that to us, we would go, there is no way on God's earth that we are going to be able to pull this thing off. And we would have shied away from it. In the same way as the disciples came to the Lord and said, Woo, this is going to take a whole year's wages just to feed these people today. <coughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it just takes the lunch of a small boy to come and say, Hey, I know in the hands of Jesus, this thing can multiply, this thing can blow way out of proportion <laughs> and can feed 5,000 plus. Yeah. Amen. So, um, what am I saying now? Okay, so the refugees was a was a, a test run for us. It was God showing us that you don't you don't weigh up the cost in this sense. Okay, because I'm able to do immeasurably measurably above more than what you could ever ask or imagine when it comes to love. When God wants to show love, He is lavish and He is extravagant. Amen. And so I knew this was the blueprint. This is what God is leading us into, guys. This is what he wants us to establish, a place of love. So that was the other circle, a venue of love. The other one was crossover to inheritance. And somehow we knew that they were concentric circles, that they, they interlocked somehow. They overlapped each other. So, so let's just go back and say, okay, God... God starts off and, he, and, 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 and he, he births a people through two people who are completely barren. He brings forth a nation. Okay. He brings forth a people through barrenness. Okay. Um, and so he plants the seed and he brings forth a nation. How does he bring forth a nation? He brings, he brings forth a nation out of 12. 12 sons. That's how he starts this nation. Okay, and what is his promise to them? Is that you will be a blessing to the whole world. Okay, you, you 12 are going to multiply, you're going to grow, and you are going to come to a place where you are going to be a blessing to the whole world. Jesus replicates this, all right? God plants the seed, out of the seed comes Jesus, and Jesus brings to himself 12. Again, 12. And he says, from you, a message, a message of, of good news, a message of salvation, of hope, of healing, of restoration, of deliverance, is going to come to the whole world. And so, you, you look at these, both these situations of, of, of God building a people and, and we look at what is that process of building. And so I, I've got to look at the number 12 to, to kind of understand this process. And the, and the number 12 is the, is the letter Lamed. I don't know if I've said that correctly, but anyway, Lamed. And it is the symbol of learning. It is literally the word for learning. So basically, you guys, I'm going to bring you together... And there's going to be a lot of learning that's going to take place. Okay? And at the center, this word lamed, is at the center of the whole alphabet, of the whole Jewish or Hebrew alphabet. It is at the center of it all. And at the center of it, it becomes the heart of the alphabet. God wants to plant His heart at the center of of it all. Okay. Of what is going to take place. As with the tribe of Levi. The word heart. Comes from the word lev. And that's what it means. Lev is at the center of everything. And so he places the tribe of Levi. Right at the center of everything. And they become the heart. God's heart. At the center of this whole community. Everything has to revolve around the tabernacle. Everything has to revolve around the worship of God. Everything has to revolve around God at the center. If God is not at the center, then we are a hum humanistic work. We are a bingo club. Okay. 
And so God plants His heart at the center of everything. And I think we need to know that if God's heart is not at the center of what I'm doing, then it is not God. Yeah. Yeah. That He is not establishing this thing. And if it's not love, and if it's not love, then, then what we are doing is we are just building something. And if God is not building it, then we are laboring in vain. The symbol of Lamed is the shepherd's staff. It's a, it's a letter of movement and constant change. It's what God is doing in our life. And you've, you've already passed the no longer the blockage of the ego, which comes from Kaf, the letter before. You've already gone, you've already gone, you've passed through the stage of, being, of your ego being dealt with. And that's what God does. You look at this process of learning and he deals with the ego. <coughs> and he deals with the nation's ego and their rights. And what, I, what belongs to me. And, and what I deserve. He deals a death blow to what you deserve. Okay. We actually all deserve death. And so he, he deals with everything that is interfering with this process of learning true identity. And he... And, and, and so that it's this process of true identity that is connected to the Creator, to Papa, to align with His will. And that's the whole learning process of what God is doing and He's building a people. Incidentally, Levi means to unite, to bring together. Okay, but it also has an, another another interesting meaning, which means to borrow or to take. Okay, but. Part of its meaning is to cleave or join to the lender. Okay, so when you borrow or you take, you are joined to the lender. Okay, you are united. So it, it still has this to, uh, to take, but you are united. It's also interestingly is Matthew, which Jesus chooses as one of the twelve disciples, his name is Levi. Okay, uh -huh. fun. And, and so we look at the word Matthew, and the word Matthew is gift from Yahweh. Gift from Yahweh. So Matthew goes from to take to become a gift to the church from Yahweh. Amazing. Hello. Love has to be at the core of everything. And I was thinking, let's just, let's just read love. This has to be at the core of everything. Love is patient. <coughs> love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Whew. It keeps no records of wrongs. Whew. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Do you remember a long time ago, um, I asked Papa, Papa, what does is, what is, what is divine calling look like? And, um, and Papa showed me the picture of a hacienda. Um, and, and the hacienda has um, these archways around the courtyard. Um, and there's a coming and going. You can come into the courtyard. There's entranceways into the courtyard and exitways. But there's all this dwelling area around the courtyard. And um, at the center of the courtyard is a fountain. And Papa says... That's what I've called you to. And I know that is a picture of the priesthood. And the priesthood holds it all together. That fountain in the middle holds it all together 
that fountain has to keep flowing. That fountain has to has to be full of life, has to be the presence of God, has to be maintaining the presence of God. What is God's ultimate aim? Is the restoration of David's tabernacle. He says, that is what I'm going to restore in the last days. Amos 9, verse 11. That is what Papa is going to restore in the last days. Let's, let's just look there so that you know I'm not lying. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be. Wow. Hello. In that day, will I, ra will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof. Yeah. Remember that word from a few weeks ago. Close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. Amen. That is what God is going to build. Jesus says, my father's house will be a house of prayer for all nations. Amen. Amen. That is what is going to be restored. And if that is not at the center of what we're doing, then we are laboring in vain. At the center of it all needs to be the heart of God. We need to build the throne of God. He says, build my throne. And if you build my throne, a river will flow from it. And that will that'll be the, that river that we've been longing for, the river of healing. Amen. It's kind of like, you know, Chris's word this morning of the priests and the incense. God is restoring the priesthood. He's restoring us to priesthood, and that is to build his tabernacle. Okay, so the crossover to inheritance. Now, the crossover to inheritance is the, is the land that was allotted to each tribe. Remember? So each tribe was, the land was divided up, and each tribe got their allotment. So in, in, in a sense, each person got their field. Does that ring any bell? Do you have a field? Yeah. Two people got a field. Um, anybody else got a field? Okay, Georgia will be covered. We all have a field. Okay. So God is giving us a field. He's given each one of us a field. And, and, and we need to start to understand this field that God has given each one of us. The first thing he wants to do, and, and I love the way he's been taking us through this process. He says, you know, you need to rid the field of its thorns. Okay? Because when I sow seed into that field, I don't want it choked up. I want it to produce. And I don't just want it to produce 30-fold or 60-fold. I want it to produce 100% of its potential. The reason why I sowed it and the reason why it's going to receive 100-fold potential is how? When we hold it in our heart. When we, when, we, when we steward this word, when we eat it and we dream about it and we, and we hunger for this word, we, we incubate this word on the inside of us. Amen. When God put his word on the inside of Jeremiah, he said to Jeremiah, you will be an impenetrable fortress because you're housing my word. Yeah. Amen. And there is a time to release it. And God wants a hundredfold from it. So we need to rid our field of the thorns. What are those thorns? The cares or distractions or fears. We need to uproot those things. What is crippling me at the moment? What am I consumed by? What are my distractions? Remember, when, when Paul speaks to the Galatians, he says, Who has bewitched you? He says, Who has taken away your fascination? Where is your fascination now? Is God still your fascination? Has your fascination been stolen? Whatever has stolen my fascination, I need to uproot it. Amen. The second thing is, the second thorn is the selfish ambition. God can't have any selfishness in the kingdom because it's His. 
And if he's going to give me a field and I've got selfishness in my heart or the third thorn, which is self or soulish pleasure, then what am I going to do? I'm going to waste it on myself. And God needs me to steward that for the kingdom. Amen. So as I said, when it comes to love, there is no waste. There's no lavish. I mean, there is lavishness. There is God is full of lavishness. And so... Um, he's given us this incredible gift, the gift of choice, which is at the base of love. Is allowing somebody to choose. You, you can choose. You can choose, is this something that I'm going to wholeheartedly go with because God's not going to force it on me? It's, a, it, a, it's an invitation. This is an invitation. And, and because He loves me so much and because He wants to express His love through me, He says, you've got a choice here. And so choice is right at the, at the bottom of it. He's still going to lavish over my life. He's still going to do stuff in my life. He's still going to show his goodness to me in the same way as he showed it to the lepers. Only one came back. But vital at the core of love is you choose. You choose. And so God gave us that word, remember long ago, about the field within a field. And I know that my field connects with your field, and your field connects with my field. And each one of our fields are connected in some way, because I do not have it all. I need you, and you need me. And together, we are in this field that God has created, this place of love, this, this uh, venue of love. And we are, we are growing, we are developing our fields, but I know that somehow we are all connected in what we're doing and what God's called us to. The, the reason He's put us in this place uh, and He's called us to this place is because each one of us, somehow, what you've got, I need, and what I've got, you need. Do you understand? Otherwise, we are going to just be lone rangers again. We're going to be building empires unto ourselves. And that's not the way God has developed His kingdom, no. We need each other. And it's all about relationship. It's that Hebrew mindset. The Hebrew mindset is that everything is in relationship. In relationship. Amen. And so when I'm reading something and I look at the word and then I see, ah, oh, that word starts with an L, a med. Oh, I wonder why that is. What is it? The What's the center letter? I wonder why that is. Because there's a relationship between the letters in the word. And I've got to understand this relationship because God is speaking louder than what meets the eye. And so um, God was speaking to Tom and Joanna uh, a while ago and, 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 and really spoke a revelation into their lives about, uh, through Joshua. Joshua 1.12 and, and um, 22 onwards, chapter 22 onwards. And he speaks this word to them and he says, help establish your brothers in the land first. I'm paraphrasing, Tom. Help establish your brothers in the land first. And then 21 chapters later, he says, before returning to your own land. Okay. So before you start getting on to, oh, let me do my thing. How can I help my brother do his thing? And you know, there's something about how can I sow into your life so that you can get going? Because you know what? I'm not going to be neglected. I'm not going to be forgotten. Do you understand? It's this foundation of love. And this is really, it's, it's not self-seeking. And it's, and it's such a test of my love. It's like, you know, I've got all these plans, all these things I want for my life, all these things I want to do. And somebody shares their plan with me and I go, Okay, that's nice. <laughs> what if God is saying to you, why don't you lay down your plans and help establish theirs first? Now that's very uncomfortable because how long am I going to lay dormant? 21 chapters? <laughs> Hello, if it needs to be 21 chapters, let it be 21 chapters because God is going to do something immeasurably above more than what I can do. Amen. Amen when He establishes me. 
so God is speaking to us this morning and he's saying, you know what? Let go of your dream and see how you can how you can affect and help accomplish somebody else's calling. Does that make you feel uncomfortable? <laughs> And see how you're going to help accomplish somebody else's calling. And so, Papa, even now, I just want to pray. Begin to reveal each other's callings. Re begin to reveal in this place the field that you've called each person to. And how we can help establish one another in that field. Amen. And so, before anything else, we are priests, okay? Before anything else, we are priests. And God, in Haggai, he speaks about, he says, how can you be about your own house, your own thing? Be about your own, like, my ambition, while the house of God remains in ruin. We've got to get it all into perspective first. Before we start establishing this field thing, before we start going into anything, oh, let's run off and, 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 and run after my ambition right now. You are a priest. The house of God comes first. Hello? Hello? The house of God comes first. Your calling is to minister to Him first. Your calling is to a place of let's build the throne of God. Let's build the throne. Let's create a place where we are worshiping, where we are intercessing. Where, and let's create a place where we know that the river of God is being released. Because one of the things he showed us was where these, where these circles begin to overlap, that's the river of God. That's the channel. That's what brings it all together. The river flows, healing comes, he's the fountain, he's right at the, at the middle of it all. Who knows that when you want to build a city, you first find a water source. Amen? Otherwise, it's really going to be a dry city. Okay. Nothing's going to live there. And so, if we're going to build anything, we're going to build the throne of God until that river flows. Amen? Let, let God be at the center of it. Now let's talk about our field. And practically our field. Our field is revealed through daily bread portions. Okay. Now our daily bread, I want to encourage you again. You're going to, oh, our daily bread again. Okay. And I'm going to harp on this more and more. Okay. Daily bread is vital. It, and daily bread is not... Okay, I need a word so that I can get through this day. Yeah, most of us do. Okay, most of us need to get up and I need, I need something. Listen, you can just open up Oswald Chambers and you're going to get a word for the day. Rather let that confirm what God is saying to you. Okay. It's all about an intimate personal relationship with Jesus. I'm not going to open up things and say, okay, I, I need a quick fix. I need something to encourage me. You know, when I was a little kid, I got this little box called Daily Bread. I think I was about three years old. And the church, the church gave it to me. I won it in a competition. It was money or the box, money or the box. And I couldn't choose uh, box, money, box. And, and so they gave me both. So, and, um, and so I was so excited about this little box that had all these little scriptures in it, all full of promises. And by the time I got to the car, my brothers had broken it. But I glued it together, and I, and I think it's still in my mother's house. This little box, daily bread. Um, and, and it's all these promises from God. Now, yeah, we, we, you know, when you're a baby Christian, that, that is exciting. You can pull those out. This is scripture. I can declare it and stuff like this. But you've come to a place of maturity. We, we, we Robins now, right? And so... Let God speak. Let Him give a fresh rhema word to you every day. And we need that word to get through, th through the day. But it's more than that. It's daily bread portions of inheritance. Okay. It's daily bread portions of God revealing your inheritance. Okay. And so He brings it down to bite size. He brings it down 
to, to things that you can start to record day by day and you start to see how God is putting this picture together through a place of intimacy, through a place where you've been, where you've been able to capture, capture His heart, a place where you've been hearing His voice, where you've been able to incline your ear uh, through day-to-day -day experiences, through things that are happening to you. All the time, more and more revelation is coming to you. He's not downloading it all in one go because the journey you are experiencing a fuller picture, a fuller understanding of the daily bread portions that he's revealing to you of your inheritance, of your field, the allotment that he has for your life. Okay, so it's not done in a day, but I want to start today. It's kind of like, you know, when was the best time to plant a tree? 30 years ago. Okay, when's the next best time to plant a tree? Today. All right. So yes, I wish I'd start Daily Bread 30 years ago. I'll have a much better picture of my inheritance and, 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 the, and allotment and the proportion that God has got for me. But I'm going to believe that God's going to accelerate things. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And that my experiences or my journey is going to be a, a, a quicker, fast yeah. pace. Let's go into the fast track and not the slow track. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we don't want to miss it. So... Um, the questions I need to ask myself is, where is love leading me? Where is love leading me? Do you know what? It, it, immediately, it eliminates these selfish thoughts. Immediately, it eliminates of, what can I accumulate for myself? How rich can I become? When I ask myself the question, where is love leading me? It breaks all that down. Amen. Because love has to be at the center of it all. And it's what God is going to establish in my life. It's what God is doing. Lamed, right at the heart of it all, right at the heart of all the learning that I'm going through, is so that God can show me His heart. Amen. Where is love leading me? It's an affection-based obedience. Okay. It's affection-based obedience. It's all heart-revealed. Remember, Hebrew mind, it's relational. Okay. So, your field is a field of love. Okay. Your field is a field of love. That helps, doesn't it? Okay. It's a place of rescue. Your field is a place of rescue, okay? Or rescue resource. Does that make sense? Okay. For restoration. Okay. God wants you to affect other people's lives. God wants you to build his kingdom, and his kingdom is about people's lives. And so the field that you that, that God has called you to is to affect people's lives and to bring restoration. Or it's a field of resource to bring restoration, to affect people's lives. It's still all about love. Amen? And so I, what I need to also ask myself is, hold on, um, I need to ask God for the discern, discernment regarding this rescue. I don't want to do, I don't want to do false rescue. Amen? I don't want to take people out of the out of the journey that they're going through. I need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Is this is this my rescue at the moment? Or is this for somebody to have to walk through right now? So we don't want to do any false rescue. The other thing I need to ask myself is is this person in my field? Okay. You might get somebody who comes across your path and they drain the life out of you. Now, if they're draining the life out of you because they're in your field, and, and there's a whole process there. You're going to have to learn about tapping into the Spirit of God and all that kind of stuff and learning how to love and unconditional love. And Okay, you've got a journey there. But if God says that person's not in my field, I can rest because that person's in somebody else's field. I can pray for them. I can do that. But I don't need to take up everybody's or the responsibility of everybody. Do you understand? Does that not free you? Yeah. Okay. Somebody asked the question about, is my family in my field? And 
There, there are occasions when your family is in your field. I'm talking about your extended family and so forth and so forth. But you know what? A prophet's not known in his hometown. And many times when you're out there ministering, God sends somebody and ministers to your family. Your family might not always be in your field. So you can graciously and lovingly be able to let it go and not feel all guilty about it. Do you understand? And just pray, Papa, please let them land in somebody's field who's going to care and love for them and love them and speak your word into their life and bring transformation and bring rescue. Amen. You know, one of the things we've, we've found ourselves asking God um, uh, over a while is asking God for an advocate. And you know how faithful he is? He sends an advocate. God, I need an advocate over there. Or, or, or Papa, I know that there's people out there that are really slandering my name right now. Will you send an advocate? You know, I don't have to go around and try and fix up all the mess that people have said about me or, or even maybe that I have done. <laughs> but you know what? God's often got somebody out there that says, hold on, let's not speak about this. Let's not say something. Let's not tear this person down. You know, And suddenly he raises up an advocate and says, hold on, that person's not like that. You know, you're just like, God's faithful. He's so good. And so, you know, he's got advocates on your behalf. Amen. And so he will have people on behalf of your family. Do you know, the interesting thing is, like, you know, there's this mindset in, 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 in Cyprus is they don't know God's good. They don't know God's good. And, and I had this appointment with, with somebody um, actually phoned me up and w- wanted to meet with me out of the blue kind of thing. So I said, okay, I'll have coffee with you. So I met with this person, and it was about some uh, one hand on, on, on this thing, but we ended up just talking about Jesus. And because um, we knew that's, ob- uh, I mean, I knew that's obviously what God wanted to do there, was talk about Him. And, and, and I said, you, you know, God is good. And the destiny He's got for your life, and this person's desperately wanting to know the destiny that God has for his life. And he had spoken about how he's drifted away from God and, and, and so on. And I said, well, why don't you ask God just to begin to reveal through signs, just in your own way, just ask him, uh, God, will you, will you show me your destiny for my life? And he said, oh, I'm too scared to do that. <laughs> so I said, why? So he says, because, you know, a bus might hit me and I might end up in jail or I might get a letter and I... En- Oh, sorry, in hospital. Or I might get a letter and I end up in jail or something like that. And I go, but that's not God. That's not the goodness of God. I mean, what would you want for your child? Okay? Would you want to break their legs so that they can learn a lesson? It's like, no. God is so good. God is so good. And there's this fear in people that if they if they really allow God and they, and they lay their lives down to God, that something bad's going to happen. God wants to rescue and He wants to reveal His love. And there's so many desperate people who need to see that God is so so good. There's so much mindset that has to change. That God is a good God. That He's not the one that we need to blame all the time for everything that's going on. We don't need to be afraid of Him. We can draw near to Him. We don't have to be afraid if we draw near to Him. He's going to break our legs. God is a good God. And and there's so many people who desperately want to draw near to Him but are afraid. And so I need to ask, my, ask myself or ask Papa, what does this person need for rescue? What are they wrestling with? Do you know the Spirit of God is beautiful? And if you ask Him in that moment, and you're sitting with somebody, and you say to Papa, what is this person wrestling with? And just let the Holy Spirit show you what that person is wrestling with. And there opens a door for you to be able to minister and bring rescue. Amen. Rescue might be on a bigger bigger scale. Amen. Um, it might be on, on the scale of, of, of your heart is for a certain type of people. And God says to you, provide a venue. Provide a venue for those people so they can be loved. 
you know, and it's like asking God for these directions and saying, Papa, I want to provide a place so that I can love these people. I want to provide a place where these people can be unconditionally lavished on. Because you know what? I don't have to worry about the cost of that. He's saying, just provide a venue. If your venue is traffic, if your, if your call is traffic women, they need a venue. They need a place of rescue. They need a place where they can be rescued into the love of God. Amen. And if that is really what God is calling you, he's saying, provide a venue, a place of love. And you know what? Your home could just be a place. Your life could just be a place. Your willingness can just be a place. Your desire to just be out there and asking Papa, what is this person wrestling with? Could be that venue that you've just provided right there and then for that person to find rescue. Papa, I want to thank you for this journey of how can we love with the measure that you love. To be able to say, I'm going to first love and not first wait for a response. Not first wait to see if the person is worthy of love. Because none of us were when you first loved us. When you lay down your life. Where you went to the cross. Where you were cursed, beaten, rejected. Where you were spat on. And afterwards where you kept pouring yourself out, pouring yourself out. Jesus, and even when you were on the cross, how many were at the foot of the cross? But you loved and you loved to the point of pain and beyond. And so, Papa, I pray that we would learn to love beyond the point of pain. Learn to love beyond the point of heartache. Learn to love beyond the point of rejection. But to keep loving and to keep providing a place for love. A landing place. A resting place, a place for rescue. I want to thank you, Holy Spirit, for just speaking to people as they commit themselves to daily bread portions of the revealing of their inheritance, their allotment, the calling, the, the place that you are, are calling them to open up. That place of love. Papa, I want to thank you for this journey of revealing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have.